some familiar and some new faces. So I'm just super excited to be with you guys. Um, I was telling Sylvia and the team before we got started, you know, trauma informed in policy, there are so many rabbit holes we could jump into that are for me, super exciting. This is the piece of the work that sort of gets my heart racing and pumping and that I enjoy so much. And so we'll do some Q and A but I wanted to give us some big framework ideas. And then last night, as I was in the hotel, I kind of tripped over a study that came out in two, 2016 that talked about uh, building trauma-informed frameworks in social policy. And what it really focused on was using trauma-informed norms and values from SAMHSA. And so I'm going to probably spend a little more time as well echoing um, some of some of those pieces as well. So let me just get us started here on some quick slides and then uh, set the framework for us. I'm working on a smaller computer, so everyone be patient with me. Um, so one of the things that I really think about when I'm thinking about trauma-informed is really how I came to this work. And so I, I think I came to it a little bit backwards than most people which was, I wasn't talking about my own trauma. I was talking about the people I was seeing in our organization. And what I found was all the issues uh, were sort of distracting me from the root cause. And, and to me, root cause, because how we prevent root cause then helps us with all the other things. So when we would say, well, some of our clients have are facing homelessness, that's why they're having these issues, or it's it's harsh incarceration sentences or it's substance abuse. What we really began to understand was that actually those were symptoms of like a different problem, which was early adversity. And many of you may be familiar with adverse childhood experiences. And so I began thinking about early adversity. So for many organizations that I work with, I say I get to speak heart work. They do this work. Sylvia and her team and many others come to this work because of their heart. Oftentimes in policy, unfortunately, it's the numbers that matter. And so I thought it was really interesting for us to talk about that the US government says that early childhood adversity cost us $458 billion annually. So I have to like conceptualize, I don't know about your bank accounts, but my bank account is never going to see $458 billion in it. So just conceptualizing what that means. In California specifically, they predict that it costs them $102.5 billion annually. So while much of what I talk about will speak to many of our hearts, it should also speak to many of our pocketbooks about why good policy matters in this framework. It cost us a lot, right? And this isn't the exponential cost, these are the direct costs. So I just want you to think about what you know about trauma-informed systems now. What have you seen? What are you doing? And I say that because for a while, especially pre-COVID, trauma-informed became quite the buzzword. Lots of people were talking about trauma-informed. And what naturally happened is people were receiving training and knowledge about what trauma is, what trauma-informed is, some of you on this call are taking the trauma-informed master class with us, right? So that's part of this learning and knowing about trauma. But what many systems and where many policies fail is, what do we do with that information? I've been fortunate enough to have some in the Antelope Valley, some great conversations about that. And the issue becomes that depending on where you are in the system, it looks vastly different. And so I use this, this elephant here to just talk about, well, what would trauma-informed schools look like, for example? Well, if I was a student, what it would look like is drastically different than if I was the superintendent. And that would look drastically different than if I were the principal or the parent or a community member. And I think that's why it becomes so complex so quickly and why we end up sometimes with bad policy. And so it's a really good thing to just think about it contextually how it is. So what we have in the United States are that the federal government and, and the agency SAMHSA specifically, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service, uh, Health 
Association came up with six trauma-informed guiding principles. And those guiding principles are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support and mutual self-help, collaboration, empowerment, voice and choice, and of course, a lens of cultural, historical and gender issues. What I find really interesting is, is that this article that was written by uh, Dr. Bowen and Dr. Merced in 2016 from a public health policy addresses specifically each of these guiding principles in thinking about the framework for policy analysis. Because how do you uh, write a policy that makes people safe, right? How do you write in safety into a policy? What their rationale was on social policy is actually how many policies don't think about these things. They don't think about the implication to others. And I'm going to specifically go to one that might be kind of surprising, and that is peer support. When we think about peer support, we often think about others with similar knowledge to us in how we support each other. So if we work in an agency, we think about how do we work together as a team and is that a trauma-informed policy? What SAMHSA actually tried to say in the trauma-informed is that peer support does include that, but it also includes lived experience. So are the people we're writing policy for involved with the policy itself? And there are numerous policies that we can point to that have left out the people they're intended. If we talk about TANF funds, if we talk about SNAP, if we talk about almost every criminal justice reform policy we've done since the early 50s, we've often left out the people who the policy is intended for from the conversation. So as a former foster kid, right, one of the things that is so frustrating is being in a room full of professionals who have hundreds and hundreds of years of experience working within foster care, talking about what they think parents need, what they think families need, what they think kids need, but yet no one in the room who represents the families, who represents the parents, and who represents the kids. And so this is a critical piece when thinking about trauma-informed policy is how do we invite in lived experience? Now, some of us have been talking about this from a socially just and, and anti-racist lens for a little bit, right? How do we invite people to the table to have these conversations? One thing we often do very poorly is invite, but not listen. We get lived experience around it, and when families begin telling us something that we feel like they don't need, we reject what they're saying. We don't give them the same amount of credibility and they don't get the same collaboration and buy-in as people with professional experiences and titles. We've all seen this happen. Uh, Sylvia and I have had some interesting conversations about undocumented uh, peoples, right? And so what happens? How do you invite them to a conversation when there is fear and they don't have the safety of something happening to them by disclosing the very thing that's happening to them, but yet their experience should inform what the policy is? How could we write new immigration policy if we don't invite undocumented people to the conversation? That by, by not doing that, we will set ourselves up for a policy that will harm people that even if our intent is not to harm, ultimately will. So in Michigan, when we had TANF originally in the 90s, right, when Bill Clinton was president and people sat in a room and thought that it was going to be a really good idea to have welfare to work programs. The intent in the room was good. No one was thinking this is a harmful policy. When it got put into practice, because no one who was going to receive TANF funds was involved with it, what we realized is, is we began removing specifically women of color who were single parents from their homes. So now we had children who were unsupervised while their moms went to work. And then what happened in communities? Communities became more violent and there was more crime in communities. And we had taken all the adults to go place them at work. On paper, it looked like a good idea. We were getting people job skills, right? We were doing all of these things. In practice, it wasn't such. 
And so when we're thinking about trauma-informed practices and policies, holding these guiding principles is a really key factor in how we should be determining those. The other important key piece in building a trauma-informed system is making sure we all have the same knowledge. I have seen, and I'm sure many of you, have attended lots of trauma-informed conversations, adverse childhood experiences trainings, but yet we're all speaking similar and slightly different language at the same time. And it's critical that we begin operating from the same lens. So when I work individually with organizations, we say we got to have the same knowledge. We have to have the same definitions for these things. So we have the same language so we can put into place the same tools and the same commitments. This doesn't change when we begin talking about organizations and collaboratives coming together or when we begin talking about community level work. We have to move and row our boat in the same direction. It's really hard when we all have good intent, but we're going in a hundred different directions. And that knowledge should consist of some pretty basic things. The near sciences, which include the neuroscience, epigenetics, ACEs, and resilience conversation, it should obviously include equity and justice. You cannot do trauma-informed work without being racially just, but it's impossible. You're not doing trauma-informed work if you're not doing DEI work. Also important in this are self-care, team care, organizational chronic stress, and burnout. And then, of course, some of the, the specific tools we need to be thinking about, coaching, connection, and mindfulness as ways that we can make universal precaution for helping those. The other thing in policy is that we sometimes fall short. <laughs> We stop at the training piece and forget we actually have to implement what we learned. This happens. Anybody who talks to funders about training knows that this is a constant struggle, which is their support to do the initial training, but the ongoing implementation is sometimes harder to find support for. And so thinking about it in these terms that we're trying to move people from not having any information about trauma, being ignorant, being unaware, to at least coming into awareness and potentially being informed. But if we get organizations that are trauma informed, we won't change anything. We won't change the, the billions of dollars we're spending. It's not until we cross over into healing centered engagement and then whole systems transformation. Because when we're doing trauma informed work, it's not just about the people we're serving, it's also about the people who work in our organizations as well. And so the thing about trauma-informed, the thing about a call-like policy that gets me so excited is it's the feel-good stuff, but it's also why are some employers struggling to have employees? You know, why, why can't we find people to work in those hotels? Why can't we find people for certain jobs? <coughs> Excuse me. So when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, what most people immediately think about was the original study. And we see that here depicted in point number one, the leaves on the tree. What the original study looked at was important and significant, but what it failed to include and what I think policy often fails to include is communities and environment. So we really have to stand back. Often we think about what's going on in individual households, but the truth is, is communities can force leaves to come on a tree and environments can force roots that cause leaves to come on a tree. And so it's really important to have a standard of practice to be looking at all of these things individually. Now, I, I wasn't planning on going into adverse childhood experiences. Does anybody feel like they need a more thorough explanation of that before I move us on? I'm not seeing any hands here. Amazing. So what we wanna be thinking about is even in policy is how do we have concrete learning? How do we have mindfulness? How do we have reflective observation, creativity, connections, and compassion 
as we move our learning cycle forward. And something that many of you have probably heard me say more than you care for <laughs> is that this is inside out work. It's inside out work individually and it's inside out work organizationally. It's inside out work in communities. So how do we take that basic knowledge base that we have and have it inform board decisions that inform leadership, that informs departments, that inform staff, that then impacts clients? What we often have to remind ourselves is how behavior is mirrored. So I'm with a group of people in person this week, and it's not what you say, it's what you do. So somebody said, well, how do we get people to start doing it? It's you start doing it. You start behaving in that way, you start modeling it, and then others will respond accordingly to that. And so that's the critical piece of understanding trauma-informed frameworks. And I think as we begin thinking about that policy component again, and going back to uh, some of those guiding principles is that we, we might not be able to make a provision for basic safety of vulnerable populations, but what we can do is, is think about the impact of that in a trauma-informed way so that it's informing us to move the work forward. And so where I wanted to spend some time focusing with you on the policy is really here in this paradigm shift. What we've often done is looked at behavior and, and it's interesting because I think it's a, it's a really culturally American phenomenon um, of our need to punish us out of a certain behavior. There's a behavior, we decide societally we don't like it, and so there should be a direct punishment for it. Um, I don't know why that is. I've got some theories we could talk about offline about that, but... We, we have this propensity of what's wrong with you and how can we change you? And what trauma-informed policy should do is at least move us to yellow of acknowledging what's happening to individuals, what's happening to communities, what's happening to environments. If we could push the policy even further, because right, small wins matter in these conversations, if we could move the policy even further, then it would be getting us to move from problem focused and problem driven to solution and strength focused. So what does that mean in real life? In real life, that means we look at a behavior instead of being oppositional, <laughs> In the political realm, this really matters, right? Instead of being oppositional, it's that we're advocating for different perspectives. And we don't have to agree necessarily, but we do need to understand it. When we stay focused on someone's being oppositional, we can't move. When we move ourselves in a trauma-informed paradigm is that they're just advocating for different solutions. Now we can really get to where's compromise? What could we do? What could this look like? This to me is one of the biggest things that matters in government and in policy in general, is that we are so steadfast on our own beliefs that we can forget there's other people who have had different experiences as well. This is on all sides of the coin here. So when we have, excuse me, someone who is stubborn, can we instead see them as persistent, right? When we have someone who is fearful, can we see them as cautious or careful? Think about in your own teams. In fact, um, I was just having this conversation where somebody said, I feel like my, uh, the people, my coworkers that I work with are really dramatic. We said, oh, could we see that as that they're just really passionate or really expressive? And what happens to us when we begin seeing this shift in ourselves and in others? And this is the same with policy. I see unfocused policy quite often and I think, okay, let's think about how we could see this through a different lens, right? The other thing that comes to mind for me with policy, and even as I was reading this public health study, 
is again the idea of universal precaution. So I don't know where everybody is or, or everybody's knowledge of universal precaution on the call today. And so briefly, I, I'm just gonna tell us the story of universal precaution and how it came to be. Since COVID, we're a little bit more in tune with what it means, but uh, so in the 80s, had you gone to the emergency room or, or called an ambulance, it was likely that your EMT would ask you, do you have a communicable disease? And based on your response to that, they would decide to put on gloves and a mask. Now, sitting in today's 2020 world, that seems absolutely ludicrous, uh, but that was best policy at the time. It was best practice, right? And then this communicable disease happened called AIDS and HIV a bloodborne pathogen, right? And so at the height of, of something that could be transmitted person to person with blood contact, and if you're an ambulance driver and EMT, obviously you're probably coming in contact with lots of blood, right? It was discovered that doctors and nurses and ambulance drivers stopped asking the question, do you have a communicable disease? When we needed them to ask it most, they stopped asking. Now, there are lots of reasons supposedly that they start stopped asking. Many of them said they were too embarrassed to ask people because they didn't want people to disclose if they had AIDS or HIV. Uh, but many said that the patients were embarrassed to answer the question as well. So our federal government spent billions of dollars actually trying to solve how we would address this issue. What was the policy we could come up with to address that no one was no longer asking if they had communicable diseases. So no one was then wearing gloves or masks and we were having higher transmission rates. It might sound vaguely familiar to something that happened recently. And so a good doctor, I think out of Philadelphia finally said, I think I have a solution uh, a few billion dollars into the study, which was what if we adapt a universal precaution? What if we stop asking patients altogether if they have a communicable disease because we're learning that everyone's uncomfortable with the question. But what we also know is not everybody knows if they have a communicable disease. Some people are carriers for a disease and they don't know they have it. And so you're not getting the right answer necessarily even when you ask the question. Then you factor in that people don't always tell the truth. <laughs> so some people know they have a communicable disease, but aren't going to tell you for all kinds of reasons. So he just suggested, what if we wear a mask and gloves no matter what? No matter who the patient is, no matter what the issue is, we will just wear a mask and gloves. And so in the late 80s and early 90s, most health institutions adapted as a best practice this universal precaution. You could come in for anything, a cut on your eye, um, uh, your belly doesn't feel well, and we're going to put on a gloves and a mask. And that became known as universal precaution. We just do it for everybody regardless, because it turns out it keeps the patient safe, but it keeps us as the providers safe as well if they don't know anything. When we apply this to trauma-informed frameworks, what we're really trying to say is we don't need to assess anybody because our first policies and a lot of our first instinct is to write policy to assess who will then get services. So we're going to assess Sylvia. We're going to see if she qualifies for trauma-informed policies, and then she'll get X, Y, and Z. When we apply a universal precaution, what we say is, let's make an assumption that everybody has faced something and instead of asking poor Sylvia about her trauma, potentially causing more trauma, right, in the way it's handled, instead of all of that, what if we just assume and we put into place these protocols that will keep both her and us safe? Because we know dealing in trauma that we can have vicarious trauma and secondary trauma and that there's these effects. So we need frameworks and policies that keep not only the people we're trying to help safe, but us safe as well.
And so I think this idea of universal precaution, no matter the type of policy that you're thinking about, is a critical one about how does this impact all? Are we thinking about everyone? Can we keep everyone safe in whatever it is we're thinking about and doing? And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing this because I feel like there's a hundred rabbit holes. We could jump down on any of those pieces, but I wanna see where you all are and what questions that you might have. Jen, I did see in the chat box that a few great comments. Um, Denise said, such a great way to think about people. And um, it is, it's it, like Sylvia, I agree with Sylvia. It's a great way the shift starts with us. So I, I just love the way you put that together. I don't know if anyone else wants to share their comments because there are a, quite a few in the chat box. We have a couple people with their hands up too. Oh. Donna, do you want to go ahead? Yes, good morning. Thank you so much. This is this is amazing. I'm the executive director at the Children's Center and, and we've been on this trauma-informed journey yeah. for many years. Um, and now we are obviously looking at as healing and we're, we're going with the times. We've been doing ACEs pilots. We've been, as a community-based organization, anything we can do to move this conversation forward, we're doing. But I wanted to get your advice. I'm going to tell you a little bit of story because I'm feeling, we're feeling stuck nowadays, mm. me and administration and then our clinical team as well. Um, and, and I'm going back to the welfare to work comment you had, how yeah. there was good intent and good policy, but they didn't think it all the way through. And I completely agree with that. So now we're in a situation and I believe the other community organizations are too. Two weeks ago, we received an emergency call from our supervisor, Catherine Barker's office about a woman who had four small children, seven, five, three, and two. She was out of money and was getting kicked out of the Red Roof Inn that morning at 11 o'clock. So she called Valley Oasis, which is our local CES provider going, I need housing. And then they reached out to us to see if we could give her any support services. And part of our programming is we do have some emergency housing vouchers. So I had one of our most experienced program managers call her and basically do a pre-screen because the way, and this is to policy, our grants go, in order for us to provide you services, you have to be working towards some goal or fall into a category like DV or relative support services or mental health services or something. Right, you gotta and, have an assessment, right? It's yeah, like social you, precaution. It's correct, got you, you gotta, and, and we're pretty liberal. We, we use getting to know you and we're really just as involved. Are you transitional age youth? I mean, poor vets going down the whole list. Well, the lady qualified or, or acknowledged she qualified for absolutely nothing. She just run out of money and her family who had been supporting her no longer wanted to help her and they ghosted her. And now she's living in a car with her four children. And we are, we are, Dimey. We're getting more and more of these people that are just simply running out of money. And the reason I bring up welfare to work is even if they've got some general relief or SNAP or CalFresh or whatever it might be, none of that is enough to, to survive on. And none of that is enough to even try to get into the housing we have. So although I feel we're properly on the journey Right now, that kind of situation where we're absolutely helpless, you know, that we can't help, it is increasing. And, and how are we going to continue to do this work if, if we're into that where we just get at that stopping point? And I know that's a lot, but it's this not a lot because it really boils down to weeks. Yeah, it, it actually boils down to our policy on prevention, right? Right. Because Let's just play it out for a minute. I mean, listen, I, I've been the kid in the car, so let's just play that, how that ends, right? I'll tell you how it ended for my family. I ended up in foster care where I aged out into homelessness. Wait, what was the problem we were trying to solve in my beginning that we were homeless? 
I mean, this is just the insanity of what we do. Right? It's like, like, hey, we're going to remove you from your parent, the only person that you know and love, because homelessness isn't safe. We use safety to harm families quite a bit in how we determine what, what is safe and what's not, especially uh, with families with substance abuse issues and, and what safety is. So we use that only to put you into a system that you're gonna age out from and become homeless, which was the exact problem we were trying to solve in the first place. So this is really about policy and practices about universal precaution. What are you trying to do? Now, the other issue in my feeling that, that um, uh, runs into this is, who is deserving? It sounds like such a basic question, but the truth of the matter is, is like when I work in child welfare, we run into this all the time. There's a family and they'll tell you what they need. We don't have transportation because I work in a lot of rural communities, right? So transportation becomes a huge issue. If we remove that child, we know it will cost the state depending on the length of the removal, somewhere between 30 and $150,000. Now, even with inflation, the cost of a vehicle is 10 to 15,000, like a really, like a running vehicle. But if you started telling people, we buy families cars, what's gonna happen? Everyone's going to lose their mind because people are getting free cars, right? I mean, we're seeing this conversation just, you know, if we talk about student debt or anything else. So it's then, well, why are they deserving of a car, but I'm not? So I work a job, I do these things. How come I'm not getting a free car? But instead, we will spend triple or, or 10 times that money to remove children who then become institutionalized and systemized that we can't get out. So this is the policy of prevention is, are we gonna start looking at prevention? What SNAP, what TANF, what criminal justice, like any policy you can think of is never about prevention. So now you have a mom in your situation who for all intents and purposes can take care of her kids no reports to CPS before this, or she would qualify for services, right? But something has happened to cause her to run out of funds. I don't know, having four kids with inflation happening might be enough to cause someone to run out of funds. You don't even have to lose a job anymore, right? And instead of thinking, hey, a helping hand, we can spend 3,000, 5,000. I mean, you tell me what the number is, 7,000, 10,000. You could tell me 30 or 40,000 to give this family to keep them safe and together and happy will save us on the back end how many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's what we typically in policy are not thinking long term. We are thinking very short term. And one of my goals on this trauma informed paradigm shift is really what's universal precaution and what's long term? Because the alternative for this woman now is to have her kids removed so that they're safe at least, right? And this is probably thought she's having as a mother. Can you imagine having to have these thoughts, by the way, of like, let me have my kids go into care with strangers because at least I know they're warm and safe and they've got food. And once I do that, and all that time and money and effort is spent and a trauma is caused, now I can get services to reunify. And you're absolutely right. One of the options she's technically given on our end is to go into a voluntary DCFS case, volunteer for family preservation, put her kids into mental health. So Just now use that word though, hold on. She can volunteer for <laughs> family preservation. Yes, yes. You all, what, what yes. How, how is that preserving family? I, you know, it's been bothering me for two weeks, this case, Every, you get these cases where we work, where your, your mind is blown and you just, this, this one for two weeks has been bothering me. It's been bothering all of us because it, because, because she's 
she's a good mom. You know, we don't see what I'm going to call the red flags for these kids. And, and, and yeah, I know. And we don't, you know, there was just, there's just nothing in that. We don't know how, we don't know where to go next. We, we know well, there's what I'm saying. So on a call about policy, it's how are we committed as a group to prevention policy? Cause that's what you're asking. And how does that get written in to our laws and our policies? So how is it, right? That someone can just be having a hard time and need help. How come that's not one of the questions on this form <laughs> that qualifies you? And it could have meters. You can't, you, you can't just need the helping hand every month, right? But, but a one time, a two time, absolutely. Who here hasn't needed something? That is the thing. Now we have that option during COVID. Of course. COVID trauma was added to our, our choices. Are you experiencing, and obviously everybody qualified, but that ended June 30th. And it was working. I mean, we, we used the COVID trauma and the ability to put them in temporary motels to build trust, to get them back to school, to get them in a vocation, to get them childcare. So when you got something going good, one of the frustrating things about this work is it's it, everything tends to be temporary and pilot. We don't know how to get it to the next step where it becomes policy. I see uh, Karen has her hand up as well. Shan I had a question or comment. Karen? Go ahead. I was just wondering how to most sensitively address the, the trauma without making the, the treatment and the help about the, the trauma. It, it, sometimes it, it feels as though there's a little bit of almost a catch-22, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, addressing the, the fact that there has been um, you know, a trauma, yet not making it about the trauma, but in order to successfully resolve these issues, you know, long term, you know, I, I think kind of acknowledging it and looking for resolution on that. So, you know, you know, I, I think of like, you know, the, these, you know, you know, instances and these experiences where, you know, someone is going through much like what was described and it's, it's how do you, how, how do you, I guess, build a spirit of overcoming this? And I know that there were some tips about that and, and the slide that, you know, kind of, you know, looking at the strengths and, and that component that's there. But yeah, th I think there's also just the, the not, not turning a blind eye to what actually did happen too. I think you're right. And everything's in balance, right? So one of the things that we've been talking about in our trauma-informed masterclass for those of you who are attending is like seeing the balance, right? If we only look at trauma, we only know part of the story. I mean, if I say for any of you on here, tell me about your trauma. I only know part. The problem is, is for, for many organizations and, and policy specifically, that's all we want to hear about. What we can't know about is your resilience, because if we know about your resilience, then you don't qualify for anything. We can't see right. the whole person. And so the answer for me in good policy is it's yes and. A person shouldn't have to be a horrible mother in the example that we heard. She shouldn't have to be beating and abusing her kids. We shouldn't want her to have to beat and abuse her kids to qualify for services. She shouldn't have to volunteer to have her children removed to family preservation to preserve her family. It's both. She can be a good mother and struggling. Those things don't have to be happening apart from each other. They can be happening together all at the same time. Carlos's point is, is right on the money that child support could be revised, right? That it destroys the presence of men in their kids' lives. But child support in general, like people need child support. Mm -hmm. And yet what we said was, if you're not going to pay child support, what's the punishment? Take a guess. You don't get to see your kids. You're not going to see your kids. No, one, no, you, right? You, we're going to sever connection. Two, we're going to suspend your driver's license. Yeah. Three, we're going to put you in jail. Right. Yeah. Tell me how suspending a driver's license is going to help you work. 
tell me how being in jail will help you support your kids. So we do these things that end like it still doesn't provide support to a family. You know what would? Job training. You know what would? Resume building. You know what would? Opportunity. But that's not what the policy says. That's right. Yeah. That's the conversation. So, like for me, this opportunity to be like, guys, policy, leadership, what do we need? We have to take these conversations into other rooms. And the reason that these don't get spoken into the rooms are people with lived experience aren't invited in. And that's the way it should be. Right? But how many people, how many people do you think who wrote the SNAP policy received? those kind of funds in their lives at any point. Very little, very <laughs> little, very, right? very little, yes. So we have to be thinking about this. So for example, for Donna, for your lady, right? How many people who wrote that policy have experienced what your client's experiencing? Absolutely none. Um, okay. And if we invited her, let's say we got her housing, let's flash forward a year or two, and we invited her and said, tell us what kind of policy would have helped your family better. Who's a better expert? Yeah. What, what doctorate degree is better than that? But well, one thing that happened that I think has created it, and I... I'm a CPA, so I, I, I'm strongly about this. They got everybody sort of addicted to the child credit, the child tax credit, and then boom, dropped it. That, that was something that they were using to, to feed and get out of poverty and pay the bills, and, and it, just, it just dropped. So That's things great. like that. It's things like that where you... Where you and I think up, I just... Up, down, heard, back, forth, no consistency, you know, in how yeah, we handle our I matters. I heard from a, a poverty expert recently. Some of you may know Donna Beagle. She's written a couple of books. She's she's a pretty interesting woman. But I, I heard her recently and she said something, I don't remember exactly, but it was like, it takes 1,785 days. It was, it was something in that range, right? Don't hold me to it. Of nothing bad happening for someone to come out of poverty. Now, what we mean by nothing bad happening is, yeah, you don't lose a job. Yes, right? There's not, no one gets sick or dies. But it also means like you don't get a flat tire. You don't wake up late. You don't get a cold. Like 1,800 days? There's only 365 in a year. I mean, can you, that's impossible odds. So this idea that, hey, people were digging out of poverty because COVID funds and they had the stability, right? And now we'll just stop it. Why? It's working. So the question becomes, who is winning by keeping people in poverty? Because someone's got to be winning. It's not us. It's not the people on this call. I guarantee you that. But someone's winning because people are in poverty. Well, poverty's big business. I mean, I know there's a place for cash advance loans and payday loans, but it is usury. You know, I, poverty is big business. And, and someone who writes the books like Donna knows that poverty is big business. It is. And I think we have to be thinking about that when we're helping policy, when we're thinking about policy. I mean, when we're in the voting booth, voting for policy, because whether you think it or not, voting is dictating policy. And so we, we have to be thinking about it in all these realms. I have the conversation all the time, just on the voting one, that does it matter who's president? It does, okay? However, I'm gonna put an asterisk. Individually, especially if you are a, per a white person on this call, how much has your life really changed depending on who's president? I mean, really, your day-to-day -day life, what changed? Now, I will guarantee you who is the chief judge in your community, who sits on your school board, and who 
is your county commissioner or whatever your township commissioner, however your community does it, is affecting your life day to day, whether you know it or not. And I tell you this is from a husband who's still a practicing attorney and people say this judge is unfair. That's not fair. And he says, you've been voting for him for 37 years, right? Because we often, those people, I mean, when you talk about term limits, those are the places where people aren't turning over. A president's only there for a really short period of time. You know, uh, it's in your local spots where they run unopposed year after year after year after year. And then suddenly no one understands and they don't know who's running and you don't know who the people are and you don't know what they believe. Your drain commissioner matters. Like these are the places, you know, those people on the ballot matter. And what often gets our focus is the much bigger pieces. And they matter too. I would just make an argument that day to day in our lives and what's happening in the community for this woman and her five or four children comes down to what's happening with the local government who does have the ability to spend money in a different way. And they're choosing not to. We could say in our local community, ARPA funds could be spent continuing these COVID programs. So I'm in Detroit today doing some training. And the article on the front page of the Detroit Free Press was about ARPA funds being spent on new police vehicles. Now, I'm not going to tell you whether I agree or disagree with whether they should be spent on police vehicles. But <laughs> out of all the things we could spend money that has zero restriction I'm not sure that that's going to have the longest term effect in our community as we might think. It's probably a need, it's on the list, but putting this mom in a house would probably in my community rise higher than a patrol car with less miles. I don't know, have one less patrol car seems better to me. Maybe walk around, don't need a car, right? So that's, it's finding this balance. Karen, that you were coming back to. It's a yes and. It is that someone can have trauma, but what's also their resiliency? The policy can have standards, there can be requirements, but who's it harming by having those requirements? Yes and. I'm, I'm a proponent. We can't just give out free money to everyone. I agree. It's a, right? But, we are giving out that money when we privatize prisons, when we privatized foster care. It's big money, it's big business. People are making money. It's just not getting into the hands of the people who really need it. And we know, we know basic income works. That has been, that has been piloted a thousand times. I was part of a program in rural Mississippi that looked at uh, basic guaranteed income. It was specifically for women of color who were single moms. Um, and everyone was up in arms. It ended up being funded by a private foundation. So nobody could stop it. <laughs> just if that tells you anything. And they said, we just wanna see if it works. And everyone was up in arms because they said, these moms will spend it on drugs and, buying chips and Mountain Dew, right? Like it was all this craziness that they said they would spend this money on. 97% uh, of the women went back to college with the money. Just to tell you, like everything everyone said was not true. And you know that there are communities in California that have done pilot programs. It works every single time. It has never not worked. So we know and, and you said it, people were getting money through COVID, they were pulling themselves out of poverty, and now it stopped. And so now we're right back to where we are. We didn't give them enough time to pull themselves out. And now from that, uh, that program in Mississippi, uh, those women, all but one ended up graduating. What's interesting is the, the, the singular one who didn't graduate from college started a business You'll love this, of providing childcare for moms to go back to school. 
So she just entrepreneurially saw the need with all the other women in the program um, and is making a ton of money and supporting herself and families and her community in a really great way. So it, it's successful beyond successful. Are there any other questions that I might be able to answer? Well, Sylvia, is that you? Am I wrapping it back up to you then? We definitely could. Um, I, you know, just okay, talking a little bit about when, you know, people are saying like, how do we move the, you know, policies? How do we advocate for some of this? Um, you know, one of the things that is that we have, that we want to come out of our policy leadership academy and we did for the first cohort is that we know that Everybody that's here right now, they're here because they want to be, and they, they're here because they care about our community and they want to see changes in our community. And, and, and maybe gather new tools on, you know, to build a, a tool chest on how to make some of that change. And one of the things that we look for is that after the cohort is done, after the Policy Leadership Academy, Best Start still has a policy advocacy committee. And, and what we want to do is, you know, this is where we invite um, people that have been through the Policy Leadership Academy or other Best Start members or residents from the community. And, you know, part of what we're going to be doing is really just taking a look at what areas we see that are most needed in the community and how do we start moving some of that? How do we start the advocacy process? How do we start the disruption of, of the policy systems? So, um, and, I, and I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what you said today in terms of like, re, you know, shifting our, our mindset on how we view things, how we, you know, that person that to somebody yesterday was the most stubborn person in the world, that could be the next policy leader that is going to start advocating and, and, and really just give you need voice. stubbornness if you're going to write policy. Let me just exactly. tell you. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, so, so I, I think that it, as, as we get some of these tools is really just start thinking about, um, you know, I'm a true believer that parents and families and residents within the Antelope Valley, we all want to see changes apart from whether we work for Children's Bureau or Children's Center or, you know, Valley whatever the, the organization, I think us as residents still want to um, see a lot of changes and, and, and bring some policy changes. And I think now it's just really then that we start taking those steps, right? And we start uh, voicing it and we start um, just really, I guess, waving the, the flags a little more. But um, part of that, like I, you know, I said, I invite anybody to be part of our, our um, policy advocacy committee. And some of you who are on the call already are part of that. And, you know, we're, we're going to start the work there. Um, but but I, I urge everybody to, to really just start practicing the, the mind shift, the change in the terms that we use, the change in, in how we see, you know, one of the biggest things that I, you know, in working in social services for over 20 years here in the Yellow Valley is, is when you are, are talking to people and and the first thing that it says is like, it's always been like that. It's never really going to change. What am I going to do to make a change? And it's like, no, that's when we have to start, you know, uh, shifting that. And, and we can, we can, we can bring some huge flags to our policy and the things that are effective. And like you said, you know, even in voting, who wants to look at that list of, of 28 judges that we don't know who they are, what they're doing, but like you said, these are the these are the people that are re, you know really affecting us at a community level, not the president and not you know the governor, but really at a community level. So it's really then also inviting us to take the time to learn about that and and really um, being able to start calling people out and saying like, well, okay, well you want to be the judge, you know, for this district. What are you going to do for our you know community? Um, and really just start pushing those buttons. You're paying them. You're paying those people. So well, again, no, you want to be doing Jen, the we appreciate you do. so much 
uh, having you here. And if anybody has any other questions, um, Shen, maybe you could share your email if anybody has any other uh, questions or ideas or um, you know thoughts that they might want to um, send your way. And um, and really, everybody, thank you so much for being here today. I love seeing the conversation that's happening. I love the the feedback that we're getting from this amazing group. And um, and again, thank you. We know you could have been somewhere else, but you chose to be here with us today. So again, thank you so much for being here. And we will, uh, Darrell, do you have um, the slide of what is coming next week? Uh, yes, I Fran? Did you want to say something? Yes, I would like to, please. Thank you very much. Um, I, I believe exactly what Ms. Shannon was saying. We need to have more people that have lived the experience who are able to speak up and say their stories and get the politicians out of our policies so that we, the people, can do something about it. And that's what I think the other problem is. We have policy, some politicians are good for us and some are kind of on the wayside and, and they're just there for themselves. But I think lived experience uh, is very, very important. I'm on a, I'm on a, tra um, I, I, I get all, I get all bottled up because I have so much to say and so much I want to do. Uh, I'm on a task force because I'm a commissioner for LA County for senior adults. And I'm on, there's a new program that just got together for California Adults and Disabilities, which is a new department. And I'm on their task force because, and I'm so happy. That made me so happy when I got elected or when I got appointed to it because that's what we need is people that have lived the experience and not all the people, I mean, because all the people that are, uh, it's not only education, it's all, it's like I said before, lived, lived experience because that's what teaches you what you're doing and how to live. And I, I can keep going on and on, but thank well, there's you. Wisdom, there's wisdom with that experience, right, friend? There's yeah. wisdom. That's right. Yep, That's you've got right. ears, you've got experience, you've got know-how, you got the, the bad and the good of what happened to you. You know what you did and how you came out of it. And so now you're able to talk about it and and now you can go forward because now you know that I, I I have something to say and and it can help somebody else. Maybe it might not help me or might not have helped me in the past. I'm not talking about me. Well, then, uh, in the past, but now maybe it can help somebody else to get out of their bad experience and that they'll get something out of it for themselves, for their children, and for their livelihood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fran, for sharing. Thank you so much. So we are coming to the, uh, okay, to, send me pictures to the end of our presentation. Let me share my screen with you just quickly. We'd like to invite you to view us and visit us on our group site. You can leave comments, especially like we talked about today. Today is a perfect place where you can go to the PLA on our group site, leave comments, share ideas, and discuss it in discussion about what we talked about even today. We wanna to encourage you to follow us on our link tree. And through our link tree, you'll be able to connect with us through our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube channel. Um, please follow us, like us, and then share this information with your family, neighborhood, and friends. Next week, we will be visited by our own Danielle Johnson. She will be our speaker, um, Managing Diversity. And many of you are familiar with, Di uh, with Danielle because she was a part of our PLA last, our last season, as well as our DEI training. I want to thank you for coming and for joining us. Again, you could have been anyplace else, but you chose to be here with us this morning. Thank you so much. You all have a great day. Thank you, everybody. God bless you all and God bless America. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. You. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Diane. <laughs>
Bye, Fran. Bye, Denise. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Gracias a todos. Great, great. Thank you, everyone.